We're in a series, if you're just joining us, the series is called Growing Smaller, which I clearly need to do, but that's another thing. It's not a series about weight loss. It's a series about the paradox of spiritual greatness. What does it mean to be great in God's eyes? I've shared the story before about, I think a few weeks ago with you, when my football coach in high school wrote a little note on the back of my, uh, the awards banquet, a little piece of paper. He called me, he said, you're, he said Jeff, be great, Coach Mac. That's stuck in my 16-year-old brain. What does it mean to be great? Make great plays, get great recognition, have other people call you great. In our culture, that's what we celebrate. People who, men and women who do great things. Greatness. But what is greatness from God's perspective? Spiritually speaking, who does God think is great? We've answered that question in Matthew chapter 20. You can turn there if you have your Bibles or follow on the screens. And again, the context here is that... uh, James and John, their brothers, disciples of Jesus, they're arguing about where they're going to be when Jesus kind of comes into his kingdom, and they send their mommy, it is Mother's Day or weekend, to ask Jesus the question, where are my boys going to get to sit on your right and your left? Those are places of honor. And this is part of Jesus' answer to that question. Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's greatness in God's eyes, giving yourself up for someone else, sacrificing your own comfort, your own security, your own needs to bless someone else, kind of what Elise West is doing in the Ukraine. But you don't have to travel around the world to be great in God's eyes. Anytime we serve someone else without desire for credit, without desire for reward, purely to glorify God and to bless them, that's greatness in God's kingdom. I don't think it's any secret that's very different than what our culture celebrates, what we value in our culture. And we are talking about this principle, this Matthew 20 principle of spiritual greatness, growing smaller, service, being a servant. How do we apply that then to every area of our lives, into our marriages, into our families as parents, into the workplace? I want to talk to you now about what it means to apply this spiritual principle of growing smaller in our community, in our neighborhood. As I was driving over here, my neighbor of the last 16 years that I've lived in a house in Batavia is moving. They're retiring to Door County. They like the cold, I guess. And their, their truck's in the driveway. They're packing up and they're moving. And it dawned on me, I've lived next to that guy for 16 years. I know his wife and I know his name and his wife's name. I know a little bit about them and their children, but I've never really had any real deep, significant conversation with him. We live next door. We live in a neighborhood where you can reach out and almost touch the house, right? For 16 years. I'm not sure I've been a great neighbor to him. What does it mean to, to be great in our communities? And we're going to, the obvious place to look for this about neighboring would be in the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. But I preached on that last couple of years over two or three times. And so we're looking at something different. I'm going to look at the book of Acts. If you know anything about the Bible, the book of Acts is written by Luke. Uh, he, Luke was a physician, so he's exact on details and dates. It's also the story of how the church got started, how the church was born, how it started, and its early days of growth. It's really one of the greatest underdog stories in all of history. Talk about a Cinderella story. An unlikely group of people, 120 Christians in the world when Jesus ascended into heaven. And they were living in a hostile environment, the Roman Empire. They grew. People were converted, radically converted. This movement grew. It outlasted Rome. It conquered Europe, but in a very different way. In fact, Roman Emperor Julian writes this, and he was called, known as Julian the Apostate, not exactly a friend to Christians, but, but believed in the Roman pagan gods. And he was frustrated that the Christians were getting so much traction and so much recognition. And here's what he writes. He wrote this in a letter to one of his, um, one of his governors. He said, um, he, he regrets the process of Christianity because it pulled people away from the Roman gods. He said that the Christian faith has been, and here we're quoting, specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal, he writes, that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless Galileans, that's the Christians, care not only for their own poor but for ours as well, while those who belong to us look in vain for the help we should render them. Here's Roman Emperor Julian, who doesn't even like Christians, acknowledging that this 
One thing that's, that's attractive about them is the way they love and serve people. Not only their own, but anybody in need. And that was unique in that world, and it's still unique in our culture today. So in the book of Acts, if you have you can Bible, you can turn there. Turn to chapter 16. We're going to look at, uh, there's three stories told right in a row. Stories of people whose lives get changed back to back to back. Luke tells these stories. And he tells them for a reason. They're kind of case studies in what it means to live next to people and to see their needs and to see God meet their needs through you. The first one, I'll read the text actually. Acts will be the whole story, verses 13 through 33. Acts 16, verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we were supposed, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us by saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. The next story is verse 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, we met by by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that her hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. And the last story. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we're all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized once, he and all his family. It's a remarkable story. There's three stories within the story. The first one is this woman named Lydia. Let's talk about Lydia. I think sometimes when you read the Bible, if you do read the Bible, I hope you do, it can seem so distant from us, so strange. Like these stories are, are weird. They don't happen this way today. But there's actually a lot of contemporary significance here and relevance. Lydia, who was Lydia? Well, we know she was a seller of purple goods. What does that mean? She liked the color purple? No, it means purple dye was the rarest and most expensive dye in the first century in that part of the world. And so she's, it's, she's a, a merchant in fashion cloth. You might think of her today as somebody who owns a fashion boutique on 3rd Street in Geneva. She's wealthy. She has a home in Thyatira and in Philippi. She has two homes. She's traveling on business. And we also know that she is a worshiper of God. That's the, when you see that phrase in the New Testament, it's referring to somebody who's spiritual. She's, she's, not, she's a Gentile. She's not a, a Jew, nor is she yet a Christian. But she's reading the Bible. She's spiritually uh, seeking and interested. She's moral. She's religious. She's wealthy, and she's, you know, morally upright. Sound like anybody in our culture? Wealthy, moral, religious people? We live in a culture full of them. Many of them are sitting here tonight. Moral people, religious people, wealthy on the world scale people. That's Lydia. What is she doing? It says that Paul and Silas, they go to the river where they think there's going to be a prayer meeting. And there is. They obviously knew about this, a place where people would gather to pray and to study it's like an ancient Beth Moore Bible study happening down by the river, right? And, and if you don't know who she is, you can Google her later. And they show up there, Paul and Silas do, and this woman's there. Lydia's there. She's curious. She's interested. She's reading the scripture. She wants to know what this is all about. And what changes her life? What changes her? It's a rational discourse, a conversation where somebody, Paul in this case, shares with her 
who Christ is. All that she's been reading about and not clearly understanding. He said, let me explain to you what this is all really about. What this religion is really all about. It's about Jesus. He is the truth. He's the fulfillment of all that you've been studying and searching for. There is no one else. The message may come in many different cultures and contexts, but there's really only one message for us. It's the same message here in Geneva as it is in the Ukraine, as it is in Ecuador, as it is in any part of the world. The message is that Jesus Christ alone has the words of life. Lydia was moral and religious, but she still needed Jesus. You know, I think we make a mistake in our culture, even in this church, where we think people that are, on the outside, they look fairly moral. They look pretty religious, and they look cleaned up, and they're wealthy. We think they're fine. We might even call them Christian. But they have not necessarily come to know who Jesus Christ is. What his death really means. That he's the only hope they have for this life and the next. That's what happens to Lydia. A wealthy, moral, religious woman who finds Jesus. Why? Because somebody shared it with her. Too often I think we stop short in these cases. We assume that because a portion is morally upright, seemingly religious, they're not in need. I think, very, you know, frankly, the gospel of Jesus Christ is especially for religious people. They need it maybe more than anybody else. You know why? Because many of them think they already have all they need. They think they're just fine. How many, by show of hands, of you were moral, religious, wealthy before Christ came and revealed himself to you? Anybody? Any hands in here? Anybody want to put their hand up? Some of you are like, I don't, do we do this in church? I don't know. I think we're full of them, of those kind of people. And the second case is the slave girl, right? Could not be more different than Lydia. If Lydia is a St. Charles or downtown Geneva boutique owner who's wealthy, think of the slave girl as a, a, a drug-addicted teenage prostitute on, the, on Rush Street in Chicago or maybe even on the east side of Aurora. I mean, could not be more different case study than Lydia. How does the gospel come to this oppressed and exploited slave girl? Not like it did through Lydia, not sitting down and having a conversation. Let me explain to you what it is you're seeking. Let me point, you, point out who it is you're reading about. Very different. Notice, she not only it says that she has the spirit of divination in her. She was possessed. Now you might say, oh, that stuff's not real. Whatever the case, whatever you don't believe or don't believe about that, the point is, something about this young girl made her either able to tell fortunes or able to convince people she could tell fortunes. And her masters, earthly masters, so she has spiritual oppression, she has psychological oppression, and she has earthly oppression, masters, people that own her and are using her, exploiting her for material gain. There's no way she's going to hear the message of Christ unless something happens to her circumstances, right? Unless something happens, how could she hear it? Robert Lincecum in his book, uh, The City of God, The City of Satan, talks about when he was a young missionary in inner city New York, working in this, in this uh, context and how uh, he was trying to reach out to these really troubled street kids. Many of them without, without their parents were drug, drug addicts or prostitutes. Or, and he said he met one girl, 14-year-old girl named Eva. Exceptionally beautiful young girl. Um, she was under terrible pressure to become a prostitute from a large gang, she said. She gave her heart to Jesus, but she said, what should I do? My, this is my life. My mother's a prostitute. I don't know my father. I live kind of with a whole bunch of people, and there's a lot of pressure on me to become a prostitute in, in, in this gang. What should I do? He says he was naive. He says, just don't give in. Pray, resist temptation, don't give in, God will bless you. He didn't see her for three months, and he saw her then, and, and, he, and she came up to him, and it was obvious that she didn't have the same light in her eyes, and he asked her what happened. She said, I, I gave in. I had to give in. I work for them now. He said, how could you do that? You're a Christian. How could you give yourself up like that? She said, you don't understand. They beat my brother. They beat my father. They threatened my mother, so I joined them. He said, why didn't you go to the police? And her answer was this. Who do you think they are? She said, that's who the gang is. The police were exploiting her. Corrupt policemen using her in this way. Now here's the point for our context. The gospel not only changes individual lives like Lydia's, it also changes the conditions in a culture that exploit people. It also changes social structures. A church that cares not just about individual lives, but about cultural structures, social problems, like what's going on in Ukraine. Young disabled men cast aside. Nobody cares. 
Do the people of God care? The people of God f across the world care? And as I say, you don't have to leave our culture to care about people that are being exploited and treated unjustly. They're in our own backyards. And the gospel comes to her is the gospel of power. Her life is changed. Whatever it is, psychological, spiritual, that's possessing and oppressing her, God and his power through Paul casts it out, removes it from her, and her life is changed. And she's transformed. Now the last one. The story of this jailer. So you, you heard the story, right? What happens is, Paul and Silas, because they take away the livelihood of these earthly masters, she can't tell fortunes anymore, and so basically they're losing out financially. They're irritated by that. They're mad about it. They call the local magistrates, and they accuse, falsely accuse Paul and Silas of stirring up trouble, and these two get thrown in prison. Not just thrown in prison, but beaten severely and thrown into prison. And then we meet this Philippian jailer, this jailer. What's his story? Well, he's neither the success of Lydia nor is he the total mess of the slave girl. In that culture, in first century uh, Roman world, almost all civil service jobs were given to ex-Roman soldiers. It's very likely, almost certain, that this jailer is a former soldier in Rome, a former centurion, per perhaps. Because this is a good job, a job that's consistent and paid by the government, and so most, almost all civil service jobs were given to former Roman soldiers. So think of this guy as a retired cop from North Aurora. He's not... He's not spiritually uh, hungry. He's not particularly morally upright. How do we know that? In verse 24 in the text, having received this order, all he said was to keep them safely. Put them in jail, don't let them out. That's his only job, only instructions. Verse 24, having received this order, he puts them in the inner prison, fastened their feet in the stocks. He wasn't told to put them in the stocks. In the inner prison meant the lowest part of the prison. And by the way, there weren't exactly good uh, sewage systems in the prisons in the first century. Paul and Silas are sitting in the cesspool of human filth in the stocks. This is a pretty callous, pretty hardened guy. Not looking, not morally upright, certainly. Not terribly religious, as far as we can tell. He's a Gentile pagan, a Roman. And he's mistreating these. He doesn't have to mistreat them, but he is mistreating them. He doesn't care at all. No compassion. Just two more men to keep watch over in his prison. Practical guy. How does the gospel come to this guy? The gospel comes to Lydia through someone telling her about Christ because she's already looking. The gospel comes to the slave girl by a radical display of God's power to free her from the oppression in her life and exploitation. How does the gospel come to this blue-collar, average, hardened guy? And by the way, we've got a lot of those walking around our culture too, don't we? Just, just average Joes who aren't nearly necessarily a success, nor are they a mess. They're just going through life. Well, how does it come to him? You know what's interesting? It doesn't really. And it's not at first. Notice, Paul brings the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ sacrifice for her and his love for her to Lydia, he brings it to Lydia. He brings it to the slave girl. But he doesn't bring it to the jailer. The jailer comes to him after what happens. Here's the point, I think. You don't tell the gospel to somebody who isn't interested. You ever hear that? You don't go force feed somebody the things of God who doesn't care and doesn't want to hear it. You show them the gospel first. And that's what happens in this context. You don't try to beat somebody over the head with the Bible or, or try to force them to hear a message that they do, clearly don't care about. You show them compassion. You show them God's love until they want to understand. They want to know. That's what happens to the jailer. Here, some of you know this story, but I'll read it again, this portion, verses 25 and following, and then I'll tell you what's going on here. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. That is not normal behavior in a Roman prison in Philippi. They're praying and singing, and everyone else is listening, because most people are crying out or whimpering. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. Now, by the way, this, I find this fascinating. When you read through the book of Acts, it's very difficult to keep God's people in prison. Peter was imprisoned, earthquake, doors fly open, he just walks right out, right? Earlier, the disciples are in prison, and they just, it, it's hard to keep them in prison. They're praying and singing hymns. <coughs> In fact, if you want to have an earthquake in the first century, put a disciple in prison. It seems like that's what's going to happen. The doors fly open. They're locked. Prison doors, they fly open. Everyone's bonds are unfastened. When the jailer woke, so he's sleeping through this, probably drunk in sleep if it's an earthquake. When he wakes up and sees the prison doors are open, he draws his sword. That's curious. He's going to kill himself. Why would he do that? Because... In that culture, 
you, you know the phrase, guard it, guard it with your life, guard them with your life? You know that comes from? Roman jailers were to guard the prisoners with their life. What it meant was, your life for the prisoner's life. Keep them in prison. If they get out, your life in their place. He knows he's going to be executed publicly. He's trying to save himself at least the shame of public execution for failing in his duties, so he's going to kill himself. That's why he pulls out his sword. And what happens? This is the remarkable part. He draws his sword, about to kill himself, supposing they all escaped. All he sees is open doors. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Stop! Don't harm yourself! We're all here! Think, now, let's just think about this for a minute. Paul was in prison with his buddy Silas and a whole bunch of other prisoners who were listening to them pray and sing. Imagine you are in prison, suffering. No one's bringing you food. There's no exercise time. There's no TVs. You're in first century Roman prison. And some weird guys are singing and praying. And it's at least entertaining. Suddenly there's an earthquake and your chains fall off and the doors fly open. What would you do? I know what I would do. I am out of here, right? Yes, hallelujah. Let's go. Paul had to do what? Convince them to stay. What would that conversation like? Really? Don't leave. Uh, why? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Hello, open doors, no chains. I think it's a sign from heaven, don't you? Let's go. Paul convinces them to stay. They all stay. Because even one gets out, it means the jailer's life. And he says, we're all here. We haven't left. This is a remarkable show of compassion. First of all, this jailer is witnessing their singing and their praying. And then when this miraculous open door policy happens, Paul convinces them to stay. An incredible act of compassion. And the jailer then, who didn't care one lick for them when he first met him, no compassion, no interest, but when they're compassionate toward him, when they spare his life, quite literally, the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and trembling with fear, fell down before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, what do I have to do to be saved? What are you saying? I want what you got. You're not like other people. If it was me, I'd have been out of here. Why would you do that for me? After the way I treated you, I put you in stocks, I put you in the bottom of the prison, the worst possible place. Notice after this, he washes their wounds, he binds them, he cares for them. That's what he should have done in the first place. He didn't do that until his heart has changed. He sees. So what do you see here? Three stories, three people's lives were changed. One is just a regular, a wealthy, religious, morally upright person who thinks she's spiritual but is searching. Someone has the courage enough to share with her the truth of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of those people here tonight and in our culture. Wealthy, moral, religious people who need to know who Jesus is. Need to know the truth. Then there's the slave girl. Someone who's been exploited. Who's corrupted who's powerless to help herself. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess there aren't many of you that were former slaves, even possessed fortune tellers in here. But I do know a few that were spiritually bankrupt and powerless to help your own condition until someone cared enough to help you. We have those people right in our own backyard too. And then you come to this jailer, just a regular dude, just a guy working his way through to retirement, you know, not necessarily an evil guy, but not a very good guy, not moral, not religious, just a guy. And two men who have the opportunity to save their, themselves don't. You know, the beauty of that story is this. Paul and Silas would not take their freedom at the jailer's expense, at the cost of his life. Why? Because they already had their freedom at the life of another. Do you hear that? Paul and Silas would not take their freedom at the life of the jailer because their freedom had already been purchased through the life of Christ. They were already free, freer than they could ever be. I told you the story before that I spent uh, over a year ago now some time in Angola. Angola is the name given to the largest maximum security prison in the country. It's in Louisiana. You don't go to Angola unless you have an 80-year sentence or higher. The average sentence there is 90 years. Worst of the worst in Louisiana. Louisiana is still on Napoleonic law, which means the sentences are harsh. If you're a third felony, is life without possibility of parole. In fact, life in Louisiana means by definition no possibility of parole. It's a dark place. But I've met some men in that prison because there's some amazing gospel ministry happening there who are freer, who, 
who convicted me, they're freer on the inside than many of us and even me are on the outside, spiritually speaking. I met a man who's a pastor of a church in the prison. He said to me, he pointed toward the razor wire around the, the compound of his particular area. It's 6,000 acres. I mean, it's a huge prison. There's 6,000, 18,000 acres, excuse me. It's the same size as Long Island. 6,000 inmates, a massive place. He pointed the razor wire and he says, I now realize that that is not, I no longer care about that gate, that razor wire. That's not the line between free and imprisoned. It's in here. And he's right. Paul and Silas weren't concerned with their own physical freedom because they'd already been set free by Christ. And that enabled them then to see this opportunity. You see, the gospel's got to get inside your life where you think differently than the world. You don't think about your own needs and yourself when that opportunity presents itself. Because most of us, me included, are running for the door. Hey, if it costs him his life, that's not my business. I wasn't supposed to be in prison anyway. Instead, they've been so radically changed that they see an opportunity by a river to share the gospel with a woman who's a wealthy merchant. They've been so radically transformed in their thinking that instead of seeing this, this demon-possessed girl, this exploited girl, as someone to be avoided or a nuisance, they see it as someone to be, have compassion on, to minister to. Instead of seeing this jailer who mistreated them unjustly as someone who's getting what he deserves, as someone who matters to God and needs to know Christ. I think that's what it means to be great neighbors. Do you notice that in every one of those cases, in every one of those cases in the scripture, they all happen, they're all different, right? But they all happen in a relational context. They all happen when there's somebody next to that person showing God's love, speaking God's love, putting it on display. It all happens because someone who knows Christ is next to somebody who doesn't, and God uses them. You want to be great in God's eyes? I, I know, I'm not saying, it sounds weird to say, right? Growing smaller, the paradox of spiritual greatness. Do we want to be great in God's eyes? Let's be great neighbors. Let's be the kind of people who see the people in our lives differently. Not as someone who can serve our needs, who can meet some need we have, but as opportunities to put on display God's love. If you've got people in your life like the jailer who just are not interested, don't force feed them. Just love them. Serve them. Be kind to them. And then maybe in God's time they'll ask, what's with you? Why do you do this? If you've got people in your life or people that you know in your, in your sphere of influence that are like the slave girl, they're exploited, they're trapped. Don't stand by and watch and think, isn't that terrible? Do something about it. Reach out to them. If you've got people in your life like Lydia, wealthy, more religious, seemingly okay on the outside, you don't know what's underneath, what they're looking for. That's what it means, I think, for us to be great in God's eyes, to be great neighbors, to share the love of Christ wherever we have opportunity. As I said, my neighbor's moving. He's moving away. I don't think I've ever shared the gospel with him. His name's Dale. He's going to Door County. I don't know if I'll ever have the opportunity. But I'll tell you what, after studying for this and thinking about it, there's a young family moving in tomorrow. I'm going to be sharing it with them. I'm going to be showing it to them. I don't want the next 16 years to go by not to know them and to love them. Will you stand with me for closing prayer? And after I pray, I'll dismiss. If you're here tonight and would like someone to pray with you, feel free to come forward at the close of the service. We'd love to meet with you down front afterwards. God, we thank you for the truth of your word and your gospel. We confess to you that we're so consumed with just the events of our everyday lives that we lose sight of who you are and who you want us to be. But we know that there are many people in our world, in our community, in our neighborhoods, even right next to us, who are in desperate need of knowing how much you love them, that you died for them, and that you have great plans for their lives. Thank you for the privilege of using us. Give us courage and grace. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And go in peace.